Okay, let's get started. So we are just about halfway through our quarter, which means we're having a midterm. We should have a midterm a little bit earlier than halfway through um, before the jot deadline, in case that's important to anybody. Okay, so today I'm going to go through what we've learned so far this quarter, which is an impressive amount. Uh, tomorrow you'll have discussion where you can talk in more detail about the practice midterm. And then, of course, on Thursday is the midterm. So midterm will be in this room during our normal class period. So just come to class like normal. Um, and what you can have with you is a calculator. And the list of calculators that are approved are, is on the syllabus. So please review that list. Um, I'll be walking through and, and making sure nobody has a calculator with a bunch of fancy stuff on it. Um, so please bring a, an acceptable calculator. Uh, you can bring pencils, of course, a note sheet, which is one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper filled on one side with anything you like. Okay. And then your student ID, of course. Um, I will have, I'll be providing this list of equations. Uh, I'm just going to put it up on the screen like it is here. And um, maybe I'll make it on two sheets to make it more readable. But basically, I'll have this whole list. And this list is also available on the web page. So you can see what's already going to be there. You don't have to cram that into your personal note sheet. Okay. This is also a pretty good summary of the quarter, right? We didn't learn that many equations. The whole goal of this class is not to memorize a lot of equations, but to figure out how to apply the few equations we learn to a wide variety of situations, right? So hopefully, this uh, you won't even have to look up to to remember these quantities. <coughs> Okay, so any other questions about the practicalities of the midterm? There's the seating chart. Seating, yes, thank you. Uh, so in a larger class, I would do a seating chart. Um, but here the seats aren't labeled, so it makes it a little tricky. So, and it's a small enough class that I can pretty well pay attention to see if anybody's copying. So just when you come in on Thursday, don't sit in your normal seat. Just find another seat. Um, just sort of mix it up a little bit. Okay? And don't cheat. That's my advice. Any other questions? Okay. How'd the practice midterm go? Not too bad. Some easy questions, some hard questions, right? What was the hardest question? Butterflies was the hardest? In my opinion. What was hard about that one? Uh, just kind of conceptually thinking uh, where all the force is being directed. Uh, I mean, when I was the solutions, it made sense, but when I was going through it, I, it wasn't really like it. I mean, after a lot of reasons for the solution, I got it. Yeah. Initially going through it, I was just like, confused. <laughs> OK. What about the uh, projectile problem? Was that one? That was probably algebraically more har harder than any yeah. other problem. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Well, the solutions are online, and if you have detailed questions, you can send me an email, as some of you have, or um, harass the TA's about it in discussion tomorrow. Also, if anybody is studying and panicked and wants uh, some help, send me an email. I'm around today, tomorrow. You can make an appointment to come by or just come by. OK? Doesn't look to me like anybody in here is panicking. That's good. On the outside, yeah. I'm sure you're all screaming on the inside, right? Or sobbing on the inside or whatever. OK, and so and I, I really tried hard to make the uh, final, the midterm be a lot like the practice, OK, but a little bit easier. All right, so we'll see how that goes. OK, so let's review the concepts. <clears throat> like I said, there aren't really that many concepts. So I'll go through them pretty quickly, and then we'll just do some exercises to familiarize ourselves with these things. So the b three basic things we deal with in kinematics are, of course, position, velocity, and acceleration related to each other because each is the derivative of the, of the other, or the integral of the other, depending on which way you're climbing the ladder. 
And for kinematics, you really only need to know this top set of equations. We only ever deal with problems that have constant acceleration. Very occasionally, we'll have something with a varying acceleration or a varying force, but almost never. And in that case, the most general form is this top one, the position as a function of um, velocity, time, and acceleration. And then as you make simplifying assumptions, no acceleration or no velocity, then the equation, of course, gets simpler and simpler. But if you know the more general form, you can derive the more specific form. OK, so let's just exercise our brains a little bit. If I give you this velocity graph, right, so this is velocity in the y-axis and time on the x-axis, which of these statements is correct? <laughs> seconds should be enough for a quick one. Click in, everyone. So we have 48 people registered for this class. We've never had more than 45 clicker responses. So either somebody's never coming or pressing F or something. OK. So is it consistent with constant velocity? No. The graph of velocity, the answer is changing, right? It's obviously not constant velocity. What about constant acceleration? How do we read the acceleration from this graph? Slope. Slope is an acceleration. Obviously not constant, right? What about varying acceleration? Yeah, this one's varying acceleration. Is it going to be constant position? Can you tell that from this graph? Huh? Yeah, obviously there's velocity. Velocity means a change in position. Right? So. Obviously, it's very acceleration. OK, here's a long series of very short clicker responses. I'm going to give you only like five or 10 seconds each one. OK, so and unfortunately, I printed this. I have to use PowerPoint to print this one for some reason. So this is it's missing a little piece out here. Anyway, this is 0 position. OK, x equals 0. So this is the ground. So imagine this is somebody uh, on the top of a building, and they, um, they give it, a, they throw it up initially, and uh, the ground is down here. OK? So very quickly, I'm only going to give you like five or six seconds per response here. Is the position start off positive, zero, and negative? All right. OK, obviously the position is positive. Is the position increasing, constant, or decreasing at this point in time? <coughs> It's increasing, right? It's going up. What about the velocity? The velocity, the guy has thrown the ball up. So does the velocity start out positive, zero, or negative? Good. Positive. And is the velocity increasing, constant, or decreasing? So who thinks the velocity is increasing? There might be some ambiguity here because are we measuring it when the guy is throwing the ball, in which case he is increasing its velocity because he's throwing it, or immediately after he lets go of the ball, right? in which case it's a free-falling object. So if you measure it from immediately after he's throwing the ball, you consider that you know, prehistory, then the velocity is decreasing. Okay? But those of you who said the velocity is increasing um, might have been confused by that. Okay, what about the acceleration? Again, measured immediately after the boy throws the ball. Good. Acceleration is negative. And is the acceleration increasing, constant, or decreasing? E. Huh? <laughs> right. It's constant and negative, right? It's just gravity. OK, what about over here? Go through these quickly. Position, positive, zero, or negative. All right? Obviously positive, still above the ground. And is the position increasing, constant, or decreasing at this point? Hmm. 
So, who thinks the position is increasing at this point? All of you who pressed A. This is at the maximum. As you can tell by my highly precise drawing, thank you very much. <laughs> ah, minus one point. Um, so who thinks it's increasing the position? It's at the maximum, right? Can it be increasing? No. OK, is the position constant? <coughs> You know how to guess. Why is the position constant? Velocity is zero. It's y velocity is zero, right? And velocity is change in position, right? So velocity is zero, the change in position is zero at this moment, right? Who thinks the velocity is decreasing? Those of you who know in the future its velocity will be negative, right? Sorry, its position will be more negative, think, oh well it has to decrease to get there, right? But it's not decreasing yet. It's at that middle point between increasing position and decreasing position, where its position is the slope is zero. Isn't the test will just be labeled as a function of symmetric? The object is at its maximum height or whatever, or we're going to have to interpret it. The question is, are you going to have to suffer through my sloppy drawings, and will that affect your grade? Um, I'm going to do my best to be precise about these things, but in the case that I draw something as a cartoony thing, I'm not going to give. I'm not going to um, grade you with high precision. Okay. Plus, I'll be here, so I can clarify any, any precise questions you have. <coughs> yes. Here we're talking the y position. Okay. All right. So in this case, it's constant, right? There is no change in position when the velocity is zero. Okay. So what is the velocity? Big surprise. Right. Uh, look at that. Years work. Okay. And is the velocity increasing, decreasing, or constant here? Okay. So, is the velocity increasing, decreasing, or constant? Half of you said velocity is constant. Who thinks that the velocity is constant here? Is it not? Change in velocity is acceleration, right? What is the acceleration here? Negative, right? So velocity is decreasing. Velocity is zero, but it's still decreasing. What is the acceleration here? Well, you notice that's really the same question, right? Whether the acceleration is negative is the same as asking whether the velocity was positive, increasing, decreasing, or, or constant. OK, is the acceleration increasing, decreasing, or constant? Acceleration is constant as it is throughout this whole problem. All right, what about when it comes up and it's re and it's returned to its original height? Okay, it's on the way back down, but it's returned to its original height. And remember, zero position is still here. It's down here on the ground. This is zero position down here. Okay. All right, so it's still positive. And is its position increasing, decreasing, or constant? Good. It's going down, right? Its velocity is negative. So, what's the velocity? Very tricky. Right? It's negative, it's going down. And is the velocity increasing, decreasing, or constant? Okay, so here it depends on a subtlety here if you're talking about the magnitude of the velocity. 
for the velocity, the value of the y component of the velocity, right? Because the value of the y component of the velocity is getting more and more negative. So in that sense, it's decreasing. Obviously, the thing is going faster and faster. The magnitude of the velocity is increasing. Right? But the velocity itself is a vector quantity. It's decreasing. Because the acceleration is negative, right? And constant. Good. Okay, what about here? Let's go through the whole rigmarole for this position. Right, so I've defined this to be y equals zero, so when it hits zero, you say position is zero. Is the position increasing, constant, or decreasing? It's not differential. <laughs> right, you think this is an unphysical problem, a ball bouncing on, on the ground? <laughs> I refuse to apply physics to that problem. It's not non-physical. Yeah. All right. So most people overcame the philosophical con uh, problem and said constant. But what's the best answer here? Do you think? Uh, well, which side are we taking? <laughs> right. It's it's a it's a razor's edge, right? So the position here is not changing, right? It's just like at the top of at the top here. Okay, what about the velocity? Here at the, at the bottom, is the velocity positive, zero, or negative? All right, so it's being squished against the ground, right? It's not moving. So the velocity is zero. Is the velocity increasing, constant, or decreasing? It's like a spring, yeah. yeah. In real life, it's yeah, like a spring. Are there any that are like have any instantaneous changes in nature, or is there always like an amount of time for everything? Well, the um, if the universe, if time was infinitely sliceable, yeah. right, then the answer would be no. There are no um, changes which are smaller than the smallest slice of time because we define time to be infinitely sliceable, right? Yeah. However, really, is in time infinitely sliceable? Yeah. Well, that's a diff more difficult question, right? Uh, when you learn quantum mechanics, you'll learn the answer is no, it's not mathematically sensible. In fact, the universe has a smallest resolution, which is the Planck scale. Uh, in, in practical terms, we, ne we can never see that, right? It's like, you know, the Planck scale is much smaller than we can detect, and so we're not sensitive to it, even in like particle colliders. In fact, we're like uh, 15 orders of magnitude away from being able to sense the Planck scale. Which is a problem for things like string theory, which make predictions of the Planck scale that we're like 15 orders of magnitude away from being able to test. Um, so for all its purposes, there is no infinitesimal. Okay. So we got distracted there. We ended up with the, the random distribution here. So here the velocity is increasing, right? Velocity was negative. Now velocity is zero. And it's headed in the direction of going positive, right? And that's because the acceleration here is okay. So some disagreement. What is the acceleration here? What is the acceleration here? It's constant and negative. Is it? Because oh, yeah, the velocity no, is, oh, hold on a minute. Okay. If the velocity is increasing, that means the acceleration has to be positive for that split second. That's right. It's the same question, right? Is the velocity increasing and is the acceleration positive? Two ways of asking the same question. Right? There can never be a different answer to those two. 
So at this moment, the ball is hitting the ground. The ground is definitely giving it an impulse, right? It's accelerating it up. It's changing its velocity from negative to positive. That's an acceleration, right? It's a positive acceleration. It's the only moment in this problem when the ball is not a free-falling object undergoing only gravity, right? It's the only moment when the acceleration is anything but negative. Is the acceleration here increasing, decreasing, or constant? Well, go on. <laughs> So, okay, so a member of the group of 16 who thinks that the acceleration is uh, increasing. You think the acceleration is increasing? I was thinking the ball is squishing, so it's expecting it to be increasing. The acceleration would be increasing. Explain to me why. It's a spring, and? Because the compression and the force will be raised in the Force will be raised. So uh, imagine it's a spring, right? And it's hit the ground, and it's compressed. Yeah. So all the potential energy is turned into kinetic energy, uh, sorry, potential energy of the spring, right? And at that moment, the force is the greatest. Right? Yeah. This force is proportional to the, the distance. And um, so, force is the greatest, the acceleration is the greatest. So why do you say the acceleration is increasing? Well, it's going it's from negative to positive, and then it goes to the max. So that is, going from that's negative that's to positive down. doesn't mean that it's increasing but at this moment. The value, you're, you're talking about the slope of the acceleration. I'm asking about the value. No, no, we're talking about the slope of the acceleration. Because that's negative yeah. acceleration going down, and then it goes to positive. Okay, interesting. Uh, who thinks the acceleration is constant? The group of the group of ten. Yeah. Like the force that has the maximum is constant for that instant. Okay, but isn't everything constant for an instant under that? <laughs> 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 yes. yeah. Well, it's not just this instant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's difficult. Okay, what about the people who think it's decreasing? Uh, well, I think it'll be decreasing. Um, assuming that this moment is when the spring is fully compressed, any moment after that, the delta x is going to be smaller than it was at that point, so that force will be less than it was uh, at that minimum throughout the rest of the pushing of the spring. So, um, I think it's a difficult, it's very difficult, and um, I would never ask you something this nasty on the exam. I would never ask you something this philosophically tricky on the exam. I just want to get you guys thinking about but it. I think it all relates to this, so it depends where we are on this curve. They're in the compression. So it depends on the model you use, right? If you use a model of, remember, you know, if you use an impulse model, like the, it makes a momentary contact with the ground, and we thought of the acceleration as looking like this, negative for most of the time, momentary positive constant acceleration, you know, there, sure. But if you think of it like a spring, the acceleration is mostly negative, and then the acceleration goes up and comes back down and then comes like this, right? Then it's a different case. And I didn't tell you what model to use here. Is the, is the ball... Uh, compressible, is it not compressible? Right? It didn't really give you enough information. So you have to come up with a physical model, apply it to this problem, and then ask questions of your physical model to get the answer. And obviously a different model you use, you get a different answer. Right? Okay, so I just wanted you to exercise your brains on that question. We're not going to have a question like this on the exam. Okay? And if you do, I'll be walking around the whole time answering detailed questions about how springy the ball was. Okay? Okay. All right, so let's keep going. Um, an easy one, right? Everyone knows the answer to this one. But it's bigger. Thank you, Galileo. Okay. Which one's less dense? So um, a lot of a vector. Remember that we started off reviewing everything you would need to know in physics too. One of those things was vectors. 
And so vectors can be added by components mathematically. They can also be added graphically, right? So which of these is the correct way to add these two vectors? Okay, a lot of disagreement. Okay, so let's check. Can A be the right answer? Well, no. Why not? Why can A not be the right answer? Don't give me heads to tails. Look at the answer and tell me whether it could possibly be right or wrong. Um, well, uh, it looks like these are similar vectors that are just reflected above like a, ver a vertical axis. So. Um, the x components are going to be in opposite directions, and they look like they're the same magnitude, so I'm assuming that they're going to cancel out. And also, if you just do the geometric method and you put the, um, the uh, tail of one to the head of the other, you'll see that um, they do cancel out. OK, so edited, the x is balanced and the y is half, right? So it should be pointing up, and it shouldn't have a large x component, right? The first one has almost only x component. Can't be right. right. The second one has almost only y component and no x component. Seems promising. The third one is the opposite, right? It's the answer is pointing down. Can you get two vectors pointing up with the answer pointing down? No. Yes? Where they wrap around the earth or something? <laughs> um, and this one is very similar to is the same answer as the top one, right? It's just drawn differently with it's a vector to the right. Okay, so check your answer, right? Do the math, whatever your method, but then check your answer, make sure it makes sense. Okay, how about this? What if you take a vector like this and you multiply it by negative two, what do you get? Okay, so you're not so easy to trick after all, right? Negative 2 means keep in the same direction, but invert the sign, and then lengthen it by a factor of 2. OK? What about if you take this vector and ask, what are its components? All right, basically, choose a pair of axes and break it down into projections in those two axes. And here, I really tried to draw a zero, a zero length vector here. Oh, oh, oh. It's like just the arrow. <laughs> okay, so that sort of gives it away. Yeah. Somebody has their E button wired wrong. Okay, what about this one? What are the components of this one? So who thinks the answer is A? Well. <laughs> Nobody? OK. Uh, what about the B? The two are opposite. Nobody? 20 of you press that button. But. <laughs> OK. They're perpendicular. Why? Sir? <laughs> I was confused on this. You were confused? What was confusing? Uh, I couldn't, I didn't know what, uh, what the question meant by saying the component of vector A along the direction of vector B is there. Okay. 
So here you have vector A and B, right? What I mean is take vector A and break it down into two components. A component that's parallel to B, a component that's perpendicular to B, right? And express A in terms of these two unit vectors defined by parallel and perpendicular to B. Right? So if you do that, you say A is some I component along I and some J component along J, right? But we've been told that the component along B is zero, which means this is zero, right? So A is only in the direction, uh, is only in the J direction, and J is defined as being perpendicular to B. Right? So A and B have to be perpendicular. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, two-dimensional motion, okay? So remember we have this one-dimensional motion that we understand well. Two-dimensional motion is just thinking about it in vector notation, right? So for example, if we have a position vector, right, which is just two one-dimensional positions written together with an with a arrow drawn from the origin to the position, right? Position vector can be confusing because it's got an arrow on it which makes it seem like it's motion but it's just an arrow from the origin to the current position. So if at time t equals zero, you have that position vector, and at time t equals two, you have that position vector, then what is the average velocity vector look like between zero and two? If you think, ah, my brain can't think in vectors, then just break the problem up into two one-dimensional problems. Remember, position in R is just x comma y. So think about it in x, Think about it in one. Okay, that looks pretty stable. So how do we figure this one out? First, what are we calculating? Average velocity is what? Change in position over time, right? Okay, so go ahead. So you add the positions together? So we add the, which two vectors? The R, R, add them together and get what? Do you? They look like they're about the same length but opposite uh, direction. Ever so slightly. Okay, maybe ever so slightly. But should you be adding the positions together? All right. Delta R is a difference, right? So don't we want to do R final minus R initial? So do we want to do vector addition or vector subtraction? Vector subtraction. Subtraction, okay. Are those uh, velocity vector or position? Uh, those are positions, it says R. Okay, so somebody else want to walk us through the solution? So you do um, final position minus initial position. Okay. That's um, R2 minus R1. And since R they're in the opposite direction, so they both point it down by direction. So two magnitude of the R. Okay. And you divide by two. So that gives you just left one as the So you think the answer is B. Okay. Anybody disagree? Anybody think the answer is A? Nobody? I love the anonymity of the vector. See, actually, that's really why I like it, because you can give an answer without having to like, raise your hand. OK, so <clears throat> you can do it in some sort of you know, vector notation here. Final, final position minus initial position, which, as our friend says, gives us a longer vector. Right? Basically, you can think of this as turn this into a plus by flipping this around, and then you get a longer vector in the same direction. But then you have to divide by 2 for 2 seconds right? to get a vector this length. 
No, I, can think, uh, I can't think about vectors like that. Well, just how would you do this in x, right? Imagine this is a one-dimensional problem. So <clears throat> the x component is one-dimensional, yes. That's right. So sure, fine. So choose an axis, an axis that goes along the arrows, right? We call this negative 1, and this is 1. If the position goes from negative 1 to 1 in 2 seconds, then the velocity is what? 1 per second, right? 1 unit per second. <clears throat> okay, questions about that? Okay, so remember, <clears throat> for every quantity we have defined in one dimension, position, velocity, instantaneous, and average, we have definitions in vector coordinates. Where did that go? Oops. We have definitions in vector coordinates, which somehow disappeared from my slideshow, which should always be broken up into components, right? So position, you have the R vector, right? R vector is just a way of saying x comma y. Don't be intimidated by it, right? Remember, you draw the direction to your position, but the direction is just defined by the origin here. So the R vector is an arrow from the origin to your position. OK? So the two-dimensional motion is just broken down into x and y. Right, which are connected by time. All right, so you have an initial position and a final position. We draw these arrows, but the arrows don't mean it's moving in that direction. There's no direction to the motion. It's just the direction from the origin to the position. Ah, here they are. <coughs> and even things like taking the derivative of a vector seems confusing unless you think about it in terms of the components. Right, it's just the one-dimensional derivatives in brackets. OK, so say you have this, these two components for these two expressions for x of t and y of t. Which of these expressions is the correct way to write r of t? This is an I, this is a J, in this crazy font, you know. See the longer J there? Yeah. <coughs> Finally, E is the right answer. Look at that. I know, yeah. For the guy who's the E button is jammed, that's been uh, finally a relief, right? Look at that. Look at that peer pressure. All right. All right, so this is the same thing. This is just another way of writing this. What's this? This is just some jibber jabber I wrote down. It doesn't make any sense. All right, it's not x times t. Okay. Fortunately, nobody fell for that. Okay, so here we have Sam and Fred. Sam drops a ball. Fred has the same ball, but he throws it sideways. So he gives it initial velocity. All right, so whose ball reaches the ground first? OK. Same time, right? Because we're talking about a question in y, and the only difference here is in the x velocity, which is irrelevant to motion in y. Right? Um, <clears throat> sometimes we get questions that seem to connect x and y. Like, remember that question we had where the guy kicks the football and he has to figure out how high it's going to go over the bar? A lot of these projectile questions seem to connect x and y. But usually you can solve the x problem first, because it's simpler, because there's no acceleration, gets the time out, and then use that to solve the y problem. The two really are decoupled. OK. So um, here's, for, here's an example. Pirate ship starts from the origin at time equals zero with initial velocity of having x component 20 and a y component of negative 15. Okay, so you can write the velocity like this, 20 comma negative 15. The ship accelerates in the x direction at 4 meters per second squared. What's the total velocity vector as a function of time? This is a real problem from the book. So turn the question into math. We write the velocity, initial velocity like this. 
We have the acceleration, it's only in x, nothing in y. Velocity is just initial velocity plus acceleration times time, right? So you want to write this down, you just say initial velocity plus acceleration times time. You're done. You could also write it in terms of components like this, 20 plus 4t, or you could use the i and j notation. They're all the same answer. Okay, what's the position vector as a function of time? Well, it says it starts from the origin, right? So now all we need to do is add this, which is r is 0, 0. That's in time equal 0. And we know the position is just r0 plus v0 t plus 1 half at squared. We know everything there, so we just plug that in. And we can express this in different ways, but it's all the same answer. So if you know one-dimensional motion, two-dimensional motion, three-dimensional motion, 11-dimensional motion is not more complicated. Circular motion. Okay, remember the conditions here are that you move in a constant radius and you have constant magnitude of velocity. And we thought about what this trajectory looked like, right? If you map out motion from a circle, you end up discovering that the individual components look like sine waves, right? Well, let's think about the directions of the vector. So at this point here, it's gone around a complete circle. Which is the position vector for this, for this ball? And this is supposed to try to be here on the x-axis. Excuse my imprecision. All right, so what's the position vector? Okay. Remember, the position vector just goes from the origin, which is at the center of the circle, to the object. So the position vector has to be pointing basically this way. What was confusing about that? That's sort of funny. I'm sorry? That is confusing. <laughs> Okay, so if the origin is here at the center, then this is the position vector goes from the origin to the, where the object is. So in this case, it would be A, right? What is the velocity vector? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, going clockwise. Okay, good. So it's heading down. And what's the acceleration vector? Good. Acceleration is pointing in toward the center of a circle that's required for circular motion. Right? And the reason is, if you think about the way the velocity is changing, the change in the velocity vector, which is proportional to the acceleration, uh, is pointing in towards the center of the circle. Okay. And for circular motion, you really only need to remember the acceleration, v squared over r. This one you can derive yourself if you remember the circumference of a circle. Okay, remember this guy? <clears throat> He's passing, throwing the ball up in the air. Just as he passes, where is the ball going to land? We did this when we were talking about reference frames. Right. So it's going to stay in his, in his hands because if you think about it from the frame of the, of the boy, he throws the ball up, it doesn't get any x velocity, so it can't move in x. Thinking about it from the point of view of the girl, the ball has the same x velocity as the boy, so it has to always have the same position if it started out having the same position as the boy. Okay, laws of motion. <clears throat> so we say a equals f equals ma, right? It's really just another way of saying we have a description of acceleration in terms of this thing we call force. Uh, the first law is objects in motion tend to stay in motion. That's sort of a, a trivial um, case. It just means 
If there's no force, there's no acceleration. So if you're already moving, you're still moving. Um, second one says net force is proportional to acceleration, which is just net equals ma. And the last one, every force is an equal and opposite force, is just due to symmetry. Right? If I push on you, you're, from your frame, you can be pushing on me. Okay? Every force is an equal and opposite uh, reaction force. <clears throat> and then we talked about free body diagrams, right? We got used to thinking about a physical system, pulling it apart to think about the forces on an individual object. Because remember that law tells us the net force on an object determines its acceleration. So before we can answer any kinematics question about an object, we need to know what the net forces are. We can't just think about what's the acceleration of this object due to this force or due to that force. It's only the net forces that determine it. So that's why you draw a free body diagram and think about all the forces on an object. Um, and so here, we're thinking, for example, about the reaction force. The monitor is pulling on the earth, and the earth is pulling on the monitor. And they have the same force, but not necessarily the same acceleration, because the masses, of course, are different. Right? So the earth is accelerating the monitor much more than the monitor is accelerating the earth. Right? And then we also introduce normal forces. It's, the normal force is this magic thing where the table responds with any amount of force necessary in order to avoid becoming deformed. And it's a useful physical model because you put something heavy on the table, usually it doesn't break. In reality, there's some point at which the table can no longer provide the normal force. In this class, we assume that these tables are infinitely capable of providing normal force. Right? Um, but if you want to understand the motion of this, you have to only draw the forces on this object. So we have. In this case, the normal force up and the force due to gravity down. Right? And then we <clears throat> took our understanding on the road and thought about what happens on inclined planes. Right? And often in these cases, it's convenient to rotate your axes and think about x and y along the, the inclined plane and perpendicular to the plane, because those are going to be the directions of motion. So in the end, you want the forces summed up in the directions that you're going to be calculating the motion. Right? So we did, I think, this example. A block slides down a frictionless plane having an inclination of 15 degrees. It starts from rest at the top and is two meters um, of incline. What's the free body diagram? Oh, we have the normal force pushing up, perpendicular to the surface of the incline, right, like this. We have gravity pushing down, but we express it in terms of components down the plane and perpendicular to the plane so we can balance the normal force with the component of gravity. And then the only thing that's left is this component of gravity down the plane, which is what um, provides the pushing and gives us the acceleration, right? The net force in Y is zero, the net force in X is not zero, and then we can use that to determine the acceleration. This is familiar stuff to you guys. Here we have a free body diagram of this crate. How many forces are there? on this crate if there's no friction. Alright, so everybody says three. So you're right, there's a normal force, there's a force down, and then there's the pulling up from this rope, right? So that's three forces. Friction complicates our lives. And remember that friction is, um, is from the, the gripping applied to two objects. And it's a very complicated physical thing that we summarize in a, with a very simple model. Right? Friction is proportional to the normal force from the surface. And a constant of proportionality is just the thing you measure from surface to surface. Right? So let's remember. Friction always acts what? Parallel to the surface, perpendicular to the surface, as an opposing force. So it is always opposing the motion and parallel to the surface, even though it's proportional to the normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface. Right? Oh, I 
which I just gave away. All right. So remember, resistive forces. Um, one model of resistive forces is R equals minus BV. It's not the only model. Okay? Some models are proportional to V squared or have V plus V squared. Uh, I'll always tell you if we have a resistance problem exactly what resistive model we're going to use. This one is pretty good. And if you have this model and you set the forces equal to each other, force of gravity down or resistance up, then you can solve for the case in which the acceleration is equal to zero. That's when you have terminal velocity because the downward uh, force of gravity is being balanced by the resistive force. Right? So you set this acceleration equal to zero, and then you get the terminal velocity. And remember, this is a sort of a funky expression. I mean, velocity here starts off um, small with a large slope, and it ends up approaching the terminal velocity, never quite reaching it. But the slope of the velocity, the acceleration, decreases as the velocity gets larger. Because the velocity gets larger, the resistance gets larger, and gravity is being, um, being almost balanced out. OK. Remember, we talked about energy. It comes in many forms. We've got kinetic energy. We have gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy. There's internal energy, for example, from friction, which is stored as heat. Um, and this is very convenient because potential energy is very simple to calculate. Gravitational potential energy, remember, only depends on your position, not on the path you've taken. And so it's very easy to calculate what is your potential energy as the book falls off a shelf. And then use conservation of energy to say everything else has to be kinetic. And so therefore, we can calculate the kinematics of a situation very easily because we know the relationship between kinetic energy and velocity, right? And then we introduce this concept of work, uh, which is not the same as the English word work. And remember, it only is in the direction of motion. So in a case like this, when you're pulling up and to the side, gravity and the normal force do no work here. We went through uh, these kinds of examples. Um, internal energy, right? if you move a book from one place to another, it starts off, you're sliding, it has kinetic energy. And then when it stops sliding, where does that energy go? Well, it's gone to internal energy. Right? It's sliding along a surface in this friction, it's losing kinetic energy into heat or internal energy. Uh, we talked about what to do in the case of varying forces. Right? Usually you can just do, say, the force is distance times, sorry, the work is distance times the force. But in the case of the force is varying, you have to do the integral of the force rather than just multiplying it. And of course, you can always start from the integral equation. If the force is constant, just pull the force out of the integral and revert to the original expression. Okay? Uh, energy conservation. All we know is that energy seems to be conserved in the universe. If you have a subset of the universe here, then the energy can vary in that subset, right? And energy transferred from one system to another is what we call work. If, however, this energy, uh, if, the, if, if you have an isolated system, right? If you say there's no energy transfer from here to here, then you can do the useful things like writing the initial energy is equal to the final energy. Or here, we, in this system, we have gravitational energy, kinetic energy, and of course, work done by friction. Okay, so, Give me some feedback about how well, how well you think you're doing in this class or how uh, easy or hard the class is. Forty-six, look at that. Yeah, people, oh, 46. oh, 46. Someone's been waiting the whole quarter. To give a reaction. Okay. And apparently, I need to make this class more difficult. I think that's a Do you think that's good? All right, so you people are getting A's. You people are getting B's. Okay.
<laughs> Question is not interesting enough, bro. There we go. All right. Cool. Least favorite part of this class. So. <laughs> Either one, both. All right. All right. I also wish it wasn't just after lunch, but it's better than 8 a.m. Right? Which is why I have to teach it after. I used to teach this class at 8 a.m., which is much worse. Okay. So that's the review. Uh, I think you guys are going to do fine on the midterm. And remember, the midterm will be curved. Okay? And also, I, re this, I recognize that this is a special group. You guys are the physics majors, and uh, expect you guys to do a little better. So we're not going to curve this class the same way we curve the other classes. It wouldn't really be fair. Okay? Um, that's good for you. By the way. Yeah, we're going to give you all worse grades to motivate you. Okay. So any questions about the midterm or problems? Come to me. Come to my office. Send me an email. Okay.